Welcome to day 49. We begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask you to open our hearts and minds today as we pray this prayer from St. Augustine, our patron and intercessor. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are going to conclude this section with the third principle uh, about what is the liturgical spirit. As a priest, when I consecrate the Blessed Eucharist or administer the sacraments, I must stir up the conviction that I am a minister of Jesus Christ, and therefore an altar Christus. And I must hold it as certain that if I am to find in the exercise of my functions the special graces necessary to acquire the virtues demanded by my priesthood, everything depends on me. O Jesus, your faithful children form a single body, but in that body all the members have not the same office. There are diversities of graces. Since you will to leave the church a visible sacrifice, you endowed her with a priesthood whose principal end is to continue your immolation on the altar, and then to distribute your precious blood by the sacraments and to sanctify your mystical body by communicating to it your divine life. Sovereign priest, you decided from all eternity to choose and consecrate me as your minister in order to exercise your priesthood through me. You communicated to me your powers in order to accomplish by my cooperation a work greater than the creation of the universe, the miracle of transubstantiation, and in order to remain by this miraculous means the host and the religion of your church. What meaning I find now in the exuberant terms with which the fathers of the church seek to express the magnitude of the priestly dignity? Indeed, their words logically compel me to consider myself by virtue of your priesthood, communicated to me as your other self. Is there not, in fact, an identification between you and me? After all, your person and mine are so truly one that when I pronounce the words, you make them your own. I lend you my lips, since I can say without lying, my body, my blood. All that is necessary is for me to will to make this consecration, and you will it so also. Your will is fused with mine. In the greatest act which you can perform here below, your soul is tightly bound together with mine. I lend you what is most mine, my will, and at once your will and mine are fused. So true is it that you act through me that if I dared to say over the matter of the sacrifice, this is the body of Jesus Christ instead of this is my body, the consecration would not be valid. The blessed Eucharist is your very self, Jesus, hidden under the appearances of bread. And does not every Mass make it more strikingly clear to me that you yourself are the priest? For you are the only priest, and it is you that are concealed under the appearances of the one you have chosen as your minister. Altar Christus. I relive that phrase every time I confer one of the other sacraments. You alone are able to say, in your quality of Redeemer, I baptize you, I absolve you, thus exercising a power no less divine than that of creation itself. I too utter these same words, and the angels are more attentive to them than to the fiat which made worlds spring forth where there was nothingness, since, and what a miracle it is too, they are capable of forming God in a soul, and producing a child of God who participates in the intimate life of the divinity. At every priestly function, I can almost hear you saying to me, my son, how is it possible for you to imagine that after I have made you, by these divine powers, another Christ, I should tolerate that in your practical routine of living you should be without Christ or even against Christ? What? In the exercise of these priestly functions you have just acted as one whose being has been melted into my very own being. And a few minutes later, Satan comes and takes my place and makes you, by sin, a sort of antichrist, or hypnotizes you to such a degree of torpor that you deliberately forget the obligation to imitate me, and to strive, as my apostle says, to put me on? Absit. 
you can count on my mercy when human weakness alone is the cause of your daily falls, which you right away regret and for which you quickly make reparation. But if you coolly adopt a program of systematic infidelities and return from these to your sublime functions without any remorse, you will only arouse my anger. What an abyss there is between your functions and those of the priests of the old law. And yet, if my prophets uttered dire threats against Zion because of the sins of the people of the rulers, listen to what came of the prever prevarication of the priests. The Lord hath accomplished his wrath, he hath poured out his fierce anger, and he hath kindled a fire in Zion, and it hath devoured the foundations thereof for the iniquities of her priests. With what severity, too, does my church forbid the priest to approach the altar or to confer the sacraments if there remain one single mortal sin upon his conscience? Inspired by me, she goes still further. Her very rights compel you to be either truly holy or an impostor. Either you will have to make up your mind to live an interior life, or else resign yourself to say to me from the beginning of Mass to the end things that you do not really think, and ask of me things that you do not desire. The sacred words and ceremonies necessarily imply in the priest a spirit of compunction and a desire to purify his soul of the slightest faults. Therefore, custody of the heart. They imply a spirit of adoration and therefore of recollection. They imply a spirit of faith, hope, and love, and therefore a supernatural trend in everything that you say or do during the day and in all your works. O oh Jesus, I fully realize that to put on the sacred vestments without being firmly resolved to strive to acquire the virtues which they symbolize is only a kind of hypocrisy. It is my will that henceforth bows and genuflects. Signs of the cross and other ceremonies and all the formulas of prayer may never be a hollow fraud hiding emptiness, coldness, indifference for the interior life, and adding to my faults that of a lying mummery under the very eyes of the eternal God. Let me then tremble with a holy fear every time I draw near to your dread mysteries, every time I put on the liturgical vestments. Let the prayers with which I accompany this act, the formulas of the missal and ritual, so full of unction and strength, move me to scrutinize my own heart and find out whether it is truly in harmony with yours, O Jesus. That is to say, whether I have a loyal and practical desire to imitate you by leading an interior life. O oh, my soul, get rid of all those compromises which might lead me to consider it enough to be an altar Christus, only during my sacred functions, and to believe that after them, provided I am not actually against Christ, I can dispense myself from working to put on Christ. Here I am, not merely an ambassador of Jesus crucified, but actually his other self. Can I attempt to get away with an easygoing piety and content myself with commonplace virtues? Useless for me to try and persuade myself that the cloistered monk is bound more than I am, to strive after the imitation of Christ and to acquire an interior life. It is a grave error based upon a misunderstanding. The religious is obliged to tend to sanctity by the use of certain special means, that is, vows of obedience and poverty in keeping his rule. As a priest, I am not restricted to these means, but I am obliged to pursue and to realize the same end, and I am so obliged by many more considerations than the consecrated soul who does not have the responsibility of distributing the precious blood. Woe to me, then, if I lull myself to sleep with an illusion that is beyond doubt culpable, since it could have easily been dispelled by a glance at the teaching of the Church and of her saints an illusion whose falsity will be brought home to me on the threshold of eternity. Woe to me if I do not know how to take advantage of my liturgical functions to discover what you demand of me, or if I remain deaf to the voices of all the holy objects that surrender me, surround me, the altar, the confessional, the baptismal font, the vessels, linen, and vestments. Imitate what you handle. Be ye clean that carry the vessels of the Lord. For they offer the burnt offering of the Lord and the bread of their God, and therefore they shall be holy. 
I would be all the less excusable, Jesus, for turning a deaf ear to these appeals. Inasmuch as each one of my functions is the occasion of an actual grace, which you offer me to form my soul to your image and likeness. It is the church that solicits this grace. It is her heart full of jealous eagerness to fulfill your expectations that cares for me like the apple of her eye. It is she who, before my ordination, tried to make me see what immensely important consequences were involved in this identification of me with you. It is no longer I that make these positions for myself. They are being made by all the true faithful, all the fervent souls consecrated to you, all the members of the ecclesiastical hierarchy who make my poor prayer their prayer. Their cries rises to your throne. It is the voice of your spouse that you hear. And when your priests are resolved to lead an interior life and therefore bring their hearts into harmony with their liturgical functions, you always grant these entreaties made for them by the church. Instead, then, of excluding myself by my voluntary neg negligence from these suffrages which I address to your Father, for the faithful at large, when saying Mass or administering the sacraments, I want to profit by these graces, Jesus. At each one of my priestly acts, I will open my heart wide to your action. Then you will fill it with light consolation and power which in spite of all the obstacles will enable me to identify my judgments with yours, my affections and desires with yours, just as my priesthood identifies me with you, eternal priest, when through me make yourself a victim upon the altar or redeemer of souls. A few words to sum up the three principles of the liturgical life. First, cum ecclesia. When I unite with the church as a simple Christian, this very union impels me to fill myself with her thoughts and her aspirations. Ecclesia. When the church herself is represented in my person, so that I, so to speak, am the church, and so act as her ambassador before the throne of God, I am all the more powerfully drawn to make her aspirations my own, in order to be less unworthy to address myself to his thrice holy majesty and by means of official prayers to exercise a more efficacious apostolate christus but when by virtue of my participation in the priesthood of christ i am an altar christus what terms can express the insistence with which you call me jesus to take on more and more of your divine likeness and that i may thus manifest you to the faithful and move them by the apostolate of good example to follow you. And so concludes this section about the three principles that are associated with what is the liturgy, this liturgical spirit. So what can we take from this conclusion section? I think one of the biggest things is for us to remember that when we are part of the church then we are an ambassador of Christ and even though our priesthood is not the ordained priesthood it's not the sacrament of holy orders for us as lay people we are priests prophets and kings by virtue of our baptism therefore it is absolutely absolutely vital that we strive to be faithful, to manifest Christ, to put on Christ, um, and we don't give ourselves a pass. Uh, this is what Dom uh, Jean Baptiste was talking about: is the fact that we can't just give ourselves a pass and think that, oh, I don't have to, as long as I'm not against Christ, I don't really have to work out and putting on Christ. And that is absolutely not true. Pope Paul VI um, said, the world listens more to, uh, not to teachers, but to doers of the gospel. So, uh, put it in kind of common phrase, no one 
is going to listen to someone who's not living it out authentically. And we can't give what we don't have. We can't share the good news if we ourselves aren't living the good news. So our resolution is for you to commit to being more faithful to Jesus today. What's that going to look like for you? It's going to be different. But what is one way that you can be a more faithful disciple to Jesus today? What is one way that you are able to put on Christ more fully so that when everyone encounters you today, they're going to see Christ and not you? Know my continued prayers for each and every one of you. Have a great day. See you tomorrow. God bless.